think you go to the left of that tree in front of you. No, that other one, yeah. And you're at 10. Climate change will affect us all in how we manage these landscapes. It'll be slow to see it, I think, for a lot of park visitors, but their perceptions will change over time. It's really our duty to explain those changes and try to appeal to the greater public that we do have an impact on that landscape and uh, we can change our behaviors to, to lessen that effect. One thing that we've done is actually establish this long-term monitoring program. We've collected really good data on select vital signs of natural resources. So everything from water quality, water quantity, high elevation species, alpine environments, um, five needle pines, sagebrush habitats, vegetation, animal species, and by tracking those over time, we're going to be able to detect changes and be able to have research scientists come in and help determine are those changes a result of climate or what are those changes a result of. Snowfall is generally declining. The other thing they expect to occur and has occurred um, in the past, at least in the northern Rockies, is there's more rain um, during the year than there is snow. That, that percentage or ratio of snowfall to rain has um, decreased. Snowmelt feeds about 60 to 80 percent of stream flow in the western United States. So it's a, it's a very important reservoir of water for both natural resources and human use. And with climate change and the increase in temperatures, we've seen uh, lower snowpack and earlier melting of the snowpack. So what we have is a double whammy where we have less available moisture that's being stored, and then it comes off earlier in the season than it has in the past. We are part of an international effort to look at change in climate and alpine vegetation and diversity. We go to the top of the mountain and we just, it's really simple work. You put out um, quadrats or meter square plots and we record what vegetation is there and we come back every five years to see if it's changed. So as temperatures and things become milder in the alpine, other plants can come up into the alpine and sort of outcompete the native species there. And that's the fear that we won't have these gorgeous wildflower displays that really draw visitors. And more than that, a lot of species depend on them. White bark pine is an especially ecologically important tree in the high elevation habitats here in Yellowstone and throughout its range. And they provide forage and food for a lot of wildlife species, including a lot of birds such as the Clark's nutcracker and black bears and grizzly bears as well. The white pine blister rust is an introduced pathogen and with white bark pine in decline, managers are really sort of stepping up and trying to assess what they can do to maintain white bark pine on the landscape and maybe even restore it in areas where they have declined rapidly. We're working collaboratively throughout the entire Greater Yellowstone area and we are selecting uh, about a hundred trees that we call plus trees. These plus trees are trees that we've determined to be resistant to white pine blister rust and then we will collect cones from those trees and then we will propagate those seeds into seed and hopefully we'll have stock of resistant trees to white pine blister rust. Mountain pine beetle are native species, but they're doing really well in the past couple decades. And part of that is because temperatures haven't gotten low enough in the winter um, to kill them. And so they even think they're now going through two cycles a year instead of just one period of reproduction. What climate change brings is uncertainty. We don't know what 
this brings? Will it change the weather patterns that may propagate white pine blisterus? Does it not allow mountain pine beetles to cycle down? Those are the kind of uncertainties that we face with climate change. The sagebrush community actually supports a lot of different um, vegetation species as well as wildlife. Uh, we can also get a greater data set by measuring and looking at um, sage throughout these different parks. You know, it allows us to look at a bigger picture on a landscape or ecosystem level. Well, sagebrush is kind of threatened all over by um, climate change, um, development, non-native plants. A lot of the sagebrush is deeper rooted, so it may survive a little bit longer, but a lot of these other perennial um, grasses, and particularly the forbs, are not as deeper rooted. So when you don't have this big harbored water table, so to speak, and, and you've lost that, that snowpack and that, that water is already out of the system, then the native species are going to suffer. I mean, it's just they're just not going to be as resilient to a changing climate. Well, we can all do a lot to affect climate change as individuals and as community. The Park Service itself is making attempts to be a good role model. Particularly, we're looking at ways to decrease our carbon footprint by doing such things as improving the insulation in our buildings and reducing the amount of energy used for heating and cooling. We're also having a more efficient fleet of vehicles so that we can decrease our our fuel in uh, consumption by those vehicles. So in those ways and other ways, the Park Service is trying to decrease its carbon footprint. In designing the long-term monitoring program, the Park Service was really thinking about the future. We're just starting to get data now where we can detect trends in some of our vital signs or the natural resources that we're monitoring. But the idea is that this is gonna be out here for a long time, long-term monitoring, and that 50 years from now, 100 years from now, we should still be in existence and we'll be able to tell then what's happened over this time, how things have changed from what we currently see on the ground now into the future.